I'm making this video because this subject turned out to be the biggest pain point of learning WebGL. In fact, I decided to create this video series in part because I knew it would force me to sort out my thinkings on this. So, this is how I currently visualize things in WebGL. Let's begin with an executive overview. Objects. There are eight different WebGL object types. These names describe what each is, and these objects, as is, are very generic. Targets, also called binding points. Each object may have multiple targets. These determine what you can do with an object. They grant an object specific abilities. Another way to put this is a target sets and expands an object's functionality. My favorite explanation is this. A target describes an object's behavior. Functions. WebGL has lots and lots and lots of functions, but until you bind an object to a target, some of these functions simply don't work. You can think of them as not existing without a binding point. Binding. Binding connects this object with that set of functions. This may be a stretch, but I tend to think of WebGL's bindings as being most similar to static binding in languages like C. Technically, under the hood, I'm pretty sure that's not true, but it makes a certain intuitive sense, to me at least. So that's the overview. Before I go on, I want to emphasize this. You do not need to understand this to be a productive WebGL developer or develop great WebGL applications, but I hope it makes WebGL seem less confusing and unforgiving. So first, what is a WebGL object? Well, here is the list of them. You can see the objects are broken down into broad categories. A buffer object, for example. It's just a contiguous block of memory for storing data generically. Not really much more than that. It's pretty easy to tell when you've encountered an object. They're almost always created using a create function, bound to a target using a bind function, and destroyed using a delete function. Simple objects are usually too generic to be useful to us, so to get specific behavior from an object, we want a target. And you'll be encountering targets by calling functions in three different situations. The first situation, of course, is when you explicitly call an object's bind function. For example, when we used draw elements, we created two buffer objects and called bind buffer for each one. One buffer was for the vertex data, so we called bind buffer with the array buffer target. The second was for index data, so we called bind buffer a second time with the target element array buffer. Array buffer is for vertex data, element array buffer is for index data. The second situation is when calling some functions, the first argument, sometimes others, will be a target, and it's a target that must be bound to already. For example, looking back to our draw elements example again, we had vertex data and index data, so we called buffer data twice, once with array buffer, and then again with element array buffer. You may have assumed that because draw elements must have two separate lists of numbers to do its job, these two targets just help distinguish one from the other, and that's true, but really you're telling WebGL how these objects have to behave and the third situation, and this is the troublesome one. You will be calling a function that does not explicitly mention a target, but that still expects a certain target to be bound to already, and if it's not, the function throws an error. Again, let's return to draw elements. When you call this function with nothing bound to array buffer, that's okay, but if you don't have a buffer bound to element array buffer, you'll throw. Here's another example we've encountered, vertex attrib pointer. Nothing bound to array buffer, it'll throw. But if you bind to array buffer before you set up your attrib pointers, you're good to go. You can even unbind your buffer after they're done. Vertex attrib pointer's job is to retain all the information it needs to find and unravel your data. And as long as you don't delete your buffer, everything works. So how do you know which of WebGL's many functions are in this third category? I spent a long time trying to find some list, and I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. The WebGL and OpenGL function documentation is a great help. It usually is pretty clear when a function depends on a target, but honestly, in my opinion, you're probably just going to find them one by one in your own programs as you encounter them. 
Now, I said that there were three situations, but there's a fourth. Consider draw arrays. We started this series with a Hello World example that used draw arrays without any vertex data, no attributes, no uniforms, no buffers, no bindings, nothing, and it worked just fine. It even painted a primitive to the screen. Draw arrays, like most WebGL functions, is target-free. I'll close this video with a partial list of targets and their associated functions. I know that there are more, but this is what I could come up with in a couple of hours or, or more, using the OpenGL reference pages and grep and node and grep again and node again. Anyways, you can download this page at this video series GitHub repo. I really hope that this helped.